on the things that I've got. I'm digging the moss back up in the sand. And after work, a cold beer in my hand. Picking wild berries off God's land. I'm drinking my buddy's homemade wine. Living in the Northwest wild. Fishing is my kind of style. I float the wine new she when it gets hot. I'm proud I own the things that I've got. I'm digging in moss back up in the sand. And after work, a cold beer in my hand. Picking wild berries off God's land. I'm drinking my buddy's homemade. Cutting out. Hey, good evening and welcome to Fish on Northwest, Dwayne England, Tommy Donlin. Hey, it's good to see you. Back home. It has been a while. Huh? Yeah. You were out. I don't know if it's good to be back. I mean, I came from a pretty tropical place right now, so. Well, it's, it's good uh, to be back in here. Yeah. It's nice yeah. to see you. Uh, it's nice to see you walk through the door on one piece and tan as ever, of course. Yep. Um, but yeah, the weather you came home to, uh, sorry, man. Yeah. You missed you know, out. I brought the sun with me for a couple days. Yeah. But then it just went downhill from there and That's true. it's been raining. Well, I experienced that transition that you speak of because uh, we had a little day planned to head out to the coast and it was the one day uh, where the front moved in, the wind showed up. Right. The snow was blowing sideways. Yep. Um, yep. I don't know if it's it's probably my age, yeah. but my I, my hands have not been that cold in a number of years to where I could not even depress the thumb bar on my oh, grill. Yes. It was bad. Yep. It was bad. That was a day uh, that I don't want to remember. Me Other didn't. than Jared got a really nice fish, so it was it was. It was all it. worth it then. Right? It was worth it then. Yeah. That one steel head. It you know, reminded me of why we steel head. Yeah. No, it was bad. Well, anyway, the welcome further, back. The man. further away you get from that pain, you know, the longer the amount of time incurs. Yeah. You forget that pain. And then you go, oh, we needed to go do it again. And then you go do it again. And then you go do it again. And you remember yep. why you didn't do it for yep. so long. Yep. Uh, unlike you, you were out killing animals, uh, fishing uh, for fish that swim well in excess yeah. of 50 miles an hour. And yes. Enjoying life in the sunshine, getting tan. Uh, yeah. Had the family there. And you guys had a look like a fantastic trip. We did. We did everything. We're going to get into that uh, first segment back after the break. What has Tommy Donlin been up to and why has he been gone for so long? Um, <laughs> so you got some uh, got some great insight for us in that regard. I was suspended uh, from the show. That's the real. Well, there reason. was that. We had a little penalty box action going on. So you say certain things. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we can't show talk you, about. We show you the door. Can't talk about kokanee that and, way. No, you cannot <laughs> disrespect the kokanee that way. We will. The door is right there, mister. Um, anyway, we got got lots to cover as we always do so welcome back my friend uh we will get into plenty um as we move along here mm -hmm. want to remind everybody that uh, fish in northwest is presented by uh defiance marine out in bremerton a better homes and garden specific commons real estate in puyallup and of course phoenix protective corp check out everything phoenix protective corp has going to www.phoenixprotectivecorp.com and we'd be remiss if we didn't remind you all to jump over to our own website the web page has been pretty active as of late there tommy Yes, indeedy. Lots of folks checking it out. Of course, that's where you shop for all these fantastic wares. Tommy is showcasing the short sleeve hoodie with the new graphic on. By the way, that graphic's going on the new boat that's soon to arrive is it? here. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that one with the horns. When the are we going to see it? Uh, soon, okay. I hope. Soon. Okay. You know, everything is backlogged. Uh, yeah. I'm fortunate as uh, some are not so fortunate in waiting for motors. I'm not waiting for motors. I'm just waiting for my Axiom screens, mm -hmm. my Axiom Pro screens, and as soon as we get those, it's good to go. We're off and running. So, All right. uh, you know, we got we got uh, got to get the screens mounted in, got to get out on the water, test all the systems, and then we're off and running. So I can't wait. Um, so yeah, we got that going on. Uh, other than that, you know, uh, yeah, jump to our website, uh, check out all our wares, check out our blogs. We have more blog contributions coming soon. And believe it or not, we're bringing back a whole new revamp of recipes. More to come on that mm -hmm. in the near future, but uh, that is some pretty exciting stuff. So lots going on, lots lots to look forward to. Uh, hey, Dave, Carl, and uh, Larry, nice to see you guys all tuning in once again. Um, appreciate you joining us. Uh, with that, Tommy, lots going on around the Pacific Northwest and beyond. Uh, ocean fishery options are on the minds of many because some of the numbers are coming out of recent North Falcon 
meetings and we have options one, two, and three, which I take three off the table. It's just kind of a throwaway. Yeah, it's, it's no season at all. So what, what's the point yeah. of even putting that in there? Yeah, I don't know. I don't understand that. So to let's make you focus feel better on, about options one and two. Well, let's I would focus say. on options one and two. What do you yeah. see when you read options one and two? You know, so the thing um, every year uh, we typically see in some of our ocean areas, we're going to see those areas close early. Um, and we're leaving tons of Chinook on the table mm -hmm. every year. I think last year you saw it in um, area one. You know, I think there was, I would have to go back and look, but it was somewhere around that 50% mark where only 50% of the Chinook quota had been achieved. Um, and because I've seen- we hit the coho. Because we hit the coho quota, right? Yep. Yep. And, um, you know, and then you look at things like Westport and, and the Westport Charter Boat Association has a huge presence in Westport. Yep. And they really drive that one schnook per person um, per day and, and, and sometimes goofy scheduling in terms of not being open seven days a week. And Westport never reaches that schnook quota. And so that's it's really sad to see that year after year. I think no matter whether you're looking at option one or two, we really need to see seven days a week in Westport and we need to see two schnook per person. And even with those kind of numbers, the, the quota would support that kind of fishery. Um, yeah, I think you're right. And, and so that's something that I want to see. The other thing is, you know, up in up in uh, La Push and Nia Bay, you can still have the coho factor. And what concerns me, you know, option two has a larger number of coho, but they're mostly allocated to the Columbia River. Mm -hmm. um, so you're still at risk of having that coho problem up in marine area three or four. Um, people keep, you know, coho, i be honest with you. I mean, anybody can catch a coho. You can go out there with like zero knowledge. You control um, a bottom bouncer in three feet of water in the open ocean, in the middle of the shipping channel. And you're, you're, gonna, and get you're, gonna, and you're gonna get coho. Yeah. I mean, I'm not kidding. Put, yeah. a, put a smiley blade out there mm -hmm. with a, with a night crawl and you're mm -hmm. gonna catch coho no matter what. Um, and so the message there is really, you know, try to lay off the coho. I know there's a lot of them. I know they're easy to mm -hmm. catch, but you know, people are gonna go out there. And if you look at the dates, we've got a June, a June fishery right towards the end of June. And then we've also got it opening up a um, different, little different style um, in July mm -hmm. for, for um, unmarked and, and those coho that time of year in early July, they're like three or four pounds. Yeah. Um, and so just just catch them, release them, and really focus on targeting those Chinook. Chinook. If you want to have a season that lasts more than two weeks, up up in three or four, that is definitely the key to success mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think your point is valid too in regards to some of these fisheries they need to look harder at, uh, bouncing it back to a two-fish limit. And yeah. even in some of them, if, I mean, they do it in river, you have like the first through the 15th yeah. on fish, and then they... They can, you know, kind of model the run, but they can they can go into it with preseason numbers ago. Then from the 15th to the 25th or to the 30th, you got a two mm -hmm. fish limit. And then you finish out the rest of the, maybe it's a couple week window, whatever, back to one fish. I mean, you can yep. do that. And, and, you know, persons who fish are pretty uh, keyed in on watching those regulations, know when that rule change takes place. Yep. We do it in terminal fisheries all the time. Mm -hmm. You have that target date. It's like, oh, then it goes to one fish or, oh, then it goes to two fish mm -hmm. or then it goes to one fish. So the fact that they haven't really you know, shown that mm -hmm. hand in these ocean fisheries, we continue to battle against hitting that ceiling quota on the coho, mm -hmm. which then removes your option or opportunity for to mop up the rest of those Chinook. And when you're talking hatchery fish that are left out there, yeah, I get it. Yeah. They're gonna progress further into the systems. They're gonna get up into the terminal areas and hopefully get caught into or land in their hatchery, great. But when we have opportunity and we're leaving them on the table in the ocean fisheries, I think we're doing a disservice and it's not a we are. really solid means of management. Yep. So Yeah, especially when it comes to hatchery fish. Yeah, yep. 100%. So yep. uh, I guess we'll see where this lands. You guys, you know, there's a lot of information floating around out there. You can simply go to WDFW website, look under uh, the news information, and they can constantly put up the bullets of information on what's been uh, addressed as of late and decisions that are in, you know, getting, getting made. So uh, continue to follow that or we'll keep you up to date week by week as these fisheries are, you know, they narrow them down and come to some conclusions so we know what we're going to look for uh, as early as this summer. Um, moving ahead, you know, it's getting about that time, Tommy, that uh, we're going to run out of time if you don't get your submission in on some yeah. multi-season tags and special hunt permits. Yeah. So Speak of the devil. Yeah, I need to, I need to get my multi-season in. Done, by the way. You're yeah. done? 
Elk and deer, yeah, right absolutely. How many, how many points do you have for the elk multi season? I think I'm up to four or five now. Okay, you're getting close. I'm at six, yeah. so I'm overdue. I should yeah. be I should be drawing that. So yeah. I'll definitely uh, put in for multi season elk once again and deer. Um, it makes absolute sense to do so. You don't have to pull the trigger on it if it's awarded to you. And there's what's interesting is there's a high percentage. Well, not a high percentage. There's a pretty good percentage of folks who then don't spend the hundred and thirty seven hundred forty two dollars and get that multi season tag. Right. Yep. Look, uh, if you are looking at seal on the deal and maximizing your opportunity, mm-hmm. you're going to get upwards, I believe, and I, I know I've said this before, but Barnard and I counted it out one season. It was roughly like 125, 127 days of hunting yep. opportunity for deer yeah. from opening day of archery on the west side all the way through final day of uh, bow yep. uh, on the west side or mm-hmm. east side, even if you're going after mule deer or whitetail. But collectively... If you bounce around from each side of the Cascades and throughout the season and choose your different you can, weapons. You can hunt every day. You can hunt. Yeah. Especially if you're an archer. I mean, yep. you can hunt. Archery, muzzleloader, rifle. You can so hunt nonstop. It's, yeah. uh, it's to your advantage to spend that extra money. First of all, to simply submit the application is six and a half bucks. Yeah. You get that in. And then if you get drawn, now you have to decide. You're going to actually pull the trigger on the, on the multi-season or are you just going to claim your weapon of choice and do that hunt only. Yeah. You still have that option. Right. It's You're not committed simply by putting in the application. Yeah. Right? What, what kills me is that, you know, say you're, say you are a West Side elk hunter, okay, right? With elk, you gotta, you gotta pick your side with elk. Yep. Okay. So say you're a West Side elk rifle hunter, but you wanna apply for that Blues Mountain tag on the east side of the state. Okay. If you don't draw that multi-season tag um, for elk, which is not easy to get, uh-huh. And you still want to draw for, you know, say you've got, you know, 25 points or whatever the case is to draw that, you know, coveted big branch antler bull tag. Well, now you've just committed your season to hunting as a rifleman. Yeah. Spikes. Yeah. Right. For the most part. Now, I understand there's some, you know, there's some select units in the northeast part of the state where you can you can chase a bull. But for the most part, you're taking part now in what's called a spike lottery. Yeah. Um, you know, being able to find a spike and then being able to shoot one, it's just tough going. So that's one of the things that I really don't like about the way the state sets up the elk hunts, but yeah. that is one of the keys that I think of the multi-season is that if you do draw it, you're pretty clear to, if you're a West side hunter, you can still draw some of those really nice East side tags, mm-hmm. but if you don't draw them, you can still come hunt your own West side ground for elk. Yeah. It's a good point. By the way, do you know who still currently holds Washington state record branch bull out of the blues archery? I don't. Oh, our good buddy, country musician, uh, Tony Wintrip, who's been in oh, multiple times. Right on. Yes, right indeed. Yeah. And that set of antlers here on the floor, this 5x5 five uh, five that uh, Bo brought us because he guides over there. He's one of the outfitters that guides. Uh, that's a 5x5 right five five out of the blues. Yep. Right on. So anyway, a little history there. Uh, yeah. So get your uh, get your uh, application submitted. Get online. Get that in. Uh, don't miss out on a great opportunity. If you're new to the multi-season facet, just do a little research. Again, you spend the money for the application, you're not committing to the full deal. That's when yeah. you, if you get awarded, you get drawn, you get to make that choice whether you're going multi-season tag or mm-hmm. uh, select your individual yeah. uh, weapon of choice. Uh, well worth it. And some of our out-of-state submission periods are closing as well at the end of March. Yep. Montana deer and elk for one, uh, mm-hmm. for example, and a few others. So pay attention to that if you've got some out-of-state plans as we do. Uh, you want to get those submitted in as well. Um, along with that, hey, uh, Ron Garner, who was on the phone several weeks ago as we discussed the uh, the removal of the HSRG process in hatchery management and the benefits thereof, uh, I believe you were, that was one when you were gone, right? Correct. Um, which, yep. you know, uh, is near and dear to our heart, especially with our saltwater fisheries and mm-hmm. even into our terminal fisheries as we do for fall salmon. Um, the, uh, the next step in the process, <clears throat> this thing isn't over. Ron did a real nice job. He pushed it out there on social media this last mm-hmm. week. President of Puget Sound Anglers. Um, go to their site. Go to our Facebook page where I've provided the links that you need to be aware of. This is a simple click. Click the box. Enter your name and information. Mm-hmm. Hit send. What you are supporting and what you are helping to move along in the process is the, HR, the HSRG has been removed, but we need to make sure the SEPA process moves forward. And what is that? This is extremely important. This is in response that you are satisfied that the determination of non-significance, the DNS, is correct 
and that we need more uh, hatchery production uh, along the following the lines of the policy uh, C 3624. Really, what does this all mean? This is critical in order for WDFW and the Northwest Treaty Tribes co-managers to start work on the co-management hatchery policy. Why is that important? Because as it's described here, they're going to basically now break down basin by basin, system by system, river by river, and uh, do the research and the, in, the uh, information needs to be provided that uh, will, will allow them to evaluate the systems in further uh, production of hatchery fish being added Mm -hmm. to those systems. So, for example, we can look at the hump tulips hatchery, uh, and I don't know the actual hard numbers, but let's just, you know, the the hump tulips Chinook output, let's say it's at 20%. Yeah. This process allows them to look in, drill down on it, and decide, um, well, we're at 20%. We got all this money from the Orca Task Force. We need to uh, support more. Uh, hatchery production Chinook into this region is the mm-hmm. uh, hump tulip system conducive to doing so the uh, the environmental impacts and all that those studies and research says yes it is mm-hmm. what can we bounce that to oh we can move it to 80 percent production mm-hmm. max, max capacity okay then let's do so they'll allocate the funds they'll uh, they'll ensure that they're not stepping on any toes in regards to wild fish recovery and and don't you know, don't throw stones at me on these numbers. I'm just pulling numbers out of Tommy's hat because uh, as a comparison, right? This allows for that process to move forward with the removal of the HSRG and yeah. get these hatcheries producing at max capacity of what they are allowed to do so. Yeah. Make the, sense? The, the bottom line was that the HSRG was a non-value added advisory period that was runaway. Yeah. Okay. There was, it was unneeded, unhelpful red tape actually preventing us from increasing hatchery production and and they are gone now but there's more steps to follow so basically go to our website check out the link follow what ron garner has put out there from puget sound anglers Mm -hmm. click it's really easy won't take you more than five minutes just follow the directions and click through but the, the bottom line is we need to look at each river system and it's hard to find a river system today that is actually even producing anywhere near the number of hatchery fish that that river system could actually sustain. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Think about that. Yeah, yeah. Most of these river systems, if we increase that hatchery production, yep. think about the fishing opportunity. Think mm-hmm. about the economic impact. Mm-hmm. It's really sad to see. If you look, and we've shown the data here. If you look at our past in the past 30 years, every year, almost every year, it, we've gone down in hatchery production. We're at an all-time low. We need to change that. Yeah, and we're no longer uh, just throwing those monies into the coffers of HSRG. That was guaranteed money to go into their their uh, works and their process yep. to just truly, as you stated uh, very well, by the way, slow the process and throw money at it. So uh, that's all gone. Uh, but we're not done. The work's not done. So as we continue to tell you, go to our Facebook page, go to PSA's uh, uh, Facebook page or their web page, log on to that link, put your name in there, agree with the SEPA process, move the process forward. We need names and persons supporting the process to get these hatcheries at max capacity, which again, environmental impacts and all things considered, it's the due diligence, it's doing, it's being done right. Mm-hmm. It's not just seeding the landscape with a bunch of you know worthless fish. It's actually, right. there's processes in place, but they need to be allowed to move forward with the process. And that's what you are supporting. And Jordan and Josh just put the link up on our, uh, on our uh, chat here as the show moves forward. So, okay, uh, Tommy, with that, we're gonna jump out for a quick break. We come back, we're gonna find out what has been going on with Thomas's travels. Yeah, Huh? let's see it. Let's see it. Let's talk about it. Got some great photos to recap the events that he has been out uh, whacking a stack and killing animals that walk yeah. on hooves. Harvesting. Hooves. Harvesting, Harvesting yeah. for the betterment of all mankind. Yeah. All right, we'll jump out for a quick break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back here at Fish on Northwest. Lance Marine is the one-stop shop for the Pacific Northwest angler. Whether you are looking for a small skiff to fish the sound or rivers or a huge offshore tuna machine, the Fines Marine has it. At Defiance Marine, be sure to power your boat with a Honda Outboard Package. Take advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty on your Honda Outboards. Our service department is always here to help and serve you as the customer. Did you know Defiance Marine has boat financing experts to help get you the best term rates on your new boat purchase? If you need financing for that new boat, call us today. 
We guarantee the best price, best service on a repower for your current boat. Defiance Marine is a Honda Premier dealership and one of the largest on the West Coast. Defiance Marine also carries all the gear that you will need. Everything from auxiliary kicker motors to fishing tackle and bait. Defiance Marine has certified technicians that are top-notch at their job. Some of the best in the Pacific Northwest at evaluating your boat issues and problems. Stop in today or give us a call for all your needs at Defiance Marine. Today, the need for quality private security services is at an all-time high. Contract Security Service provides day-to-day -day peace of mind as they protect people and property. Here at Phoenix, we provide service for multiple state and federal contracts with services ranging from uniform, patrol, alarm monitoring, canine detection, executive protection, as well as investigative work. Phoenix client management models are built on understanding our client's security needs and responding with a tailored program that is best fit for them. Phoenix provides excellent customer service through well-trained, highly motivated security professionals. Recruiting highly qualified officers is the first step in building a strong team. Currently, we are comprised of 70% prior law enforcement and military veterans. If you are prior military or law enforcement, go to www.phoenixprotectivecorps.com and apply today. Hey, welcome back in studio to Wayne England, Tommy Donlin, back in the house. Hey, yo. Yeah, buddy. Uh, a couple <laughs> comments on here, Tommy. Um, referring to uh, your suit is not going to help. Yeah. It's going to hurt uh, more than help. Tribes could say no to allowing us to sign on their permit. So just for confusion's sake, it's not our suit. It's Fish Northwest, not Fish Hunt Northwest. Um, Fish Northwest, and we've had them on a few times with Mark talking about a couple of the lawsuits that they are moving forward uh, in District mm -hmm. 3, court out of Seattle. Um, in regards to allocation, uh, history of the bull decision, allocation, and, and decisions that they want to see handed down. Thus far, yeah. and I have to check back with Mark once again to see our updates, but <clears throat> so far the judge has been holding on to it. It hasn't made a decision whether it's going to actually get a hearing or not. So right. it's just kind of in limbo. Yep. Um, but again, that's not, <laughs> you that's not us. Have, we don't that's have time not, to file lawsuits. We do not have time for that. We got sisters yeah. in Port Townsend in Seattle yeah. filing lawsuits Trying on behalf of hunting. Spring Bear. So we got we got our bases covered. Yeah. They're handling yeah. our business. <laughs> so yep. we'll just let them have that. Uh, all right. We got uh, Robert Strong. What? Checking in from Mexico. Acapulco, Mexico. What? Are you really? Right Fantastic, on. buddy. Nice to know. All right. Well, when you, when you pack that extra 20 pounds on down there and come home, I got you. I got you covered. We'll get you. We'll get you trimmed down. Uh, okay, Tommy, you are just returned from a few weeks uh, over on the islands, my friend. And it looks like you guys had an amazing time. We did. Uh, little hunting, little fishing. Tell us uh, what uh, what exactly on the waters were you going after? What were you successful in, mm -hmm. in going getting? You know, so the, so the first thing I'll mention was we were in Kona, Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, Big Island, and Kona is is pretty much um, by many considered the blue marlin capital of the world. Yeah. Okay. For every month of the year there, you have a chance at catching a grander uh, marlin, a 1,000 pound uh, blue marlin. So it's a pretty a pretty special place, phenomenal. How you many know, of those a year come out of there, you think? You know, I think you're probably seeing, if I had to guess, it's probably on the order, you know, three or four, maybe five. A fish that's in excess yeah. of 1,000 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Is that Big your goal? Fish. Oh, I'd love, I'd love, uh -huh. dude, I'd love to have that on my bucket list, but I mean, yeah. I'll t I'll just to give you an idea. So I go, um, I have, uh, the luck of fishing with Bomboy Lannis, who is, um, you know, he's been fishing down there since he was a little kid, 10 years old out on the blue water. And, uh, he himself, and he's, he's a lure maker. He makes Bomboy lures. He does taxidermy. He hunts, uh, archery competition, really the whole nine yards down there. And, um, he has two granders to his name. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and it's been uh, a whole life deal. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And so, you know, thinking about it, maybe maybe the number's more like two a year. Okay. You know, but um, for every month of fishing down there in Kona, there's been a, a grander caught for every month. And, you know, there's a lot of big fish around there right now. Um, after day one coming in, there was a, a boat just a couple down, a couple boats down from us, and uh, they had caught a 60-pound yellowfin tuna, okay? sizable yellowfin tuna yeah and um guess what showed up chasing that tuna underneath the boat like right there you're standing you're watching this tuna pinwheel 50 feet below the boat and what do you think showed up chasing that tuna 
A shark? An 800-pound blue marlin. <clears throat> An 800-pound blue marlin yeah. chased the tuna. Right. Okay. Now, they tried to bait it with mackerel, right? But that, that marlin had one thing on its mind. That big tuna. And that was to eat that 60-pound tuna. Well, why didn't you it. put that bag out there? Well, <laughs> I think if they would have had the right hook set up, uh -huh. they probably could have put a big, nasty, like, 15-aught circle hook on that tuna's face and sent him back in the water, and they would have had a chance at catching that marlin. Imagine using a 50 pound fish as your bait. Yeah, they yeah. do. You should see the size of the baits. That's they unbelievable. Use. Yep. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, one of the things down there, we got, I got leader, my first blue marlin. Oh, that's right. Never, we got the picture on never, that. Never leader to blue marlin before. How'd that go? How big was that one? It was about 250 pounds. And, 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 and you got to put this into perspective. So in Hawaii, they consider that to be a rat, a small, a small 250 blue pound, 250 fish. pound fish. Yeah. You know, and, and my buddy running the boat, he goes, you know, he goes, get him. And I'm like, get him? He's like, get him. Get on the leader. I'm like, okay. You know, no formal training whatsoever. Um, never leader to Marlin or anything of that nature. You've watched you know, it plenty of times. I, I, I've seen it. But, you know, to be connected with a 600-pound leader directly to, you know, a fish that's 250 pounds, mad is that a uh grab and kind of roll and not get around right you're right? not taking an over you're not wrapping the leader over itself on your hand right you're kind of you're wrapping around and you're getting a wrap around your hand but you're not like half hitching you know no. you're not lead you know because if it's that fish pull takes off, off it's gonna pull off right and that way if the fish takes off you can just kind of point your hand leader dumps and yeah. that's it yeah. you know but it's like it's all legs and it's all back you're not sitting there doing a bicep curl how far to bring out that leader is in. that fish when you start leadering 20 feet. The leader's about 20 okay, feet long. So when you see yep. clear. So as soon as you get to that swivel, you're grabbing the yeah. leader and you're going through 20 feet until you get to that fish. Yeah. You know, and you got to watch, you got to watch what that fish is doing. Cause if it takes off, you got to yeah. dump it. Yeah. It could come at you, come towards the boat. Sure. If, and in a lot, you know, in some cases they've come in the boat. Yeah. Right. So you just, you really have to be on point, pay attention. Um, but I mean, that was a really cool experience to see that fish to be there. Um, phenomenal. My audio cutting out? I thought it was for a second. Yeah, it sounded like out? it was. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Check your, uh, we'll see. Check your deal. Yeah, I'm green. Okay. Green, good to go. Stop moving. Um, <laughs> Stop yeah. breathing. Yeah. Um, yeah, like guys are commenting here, I'd love to catch a rat. I mean, right. 50 pounds, right? right? I mean, why not? So yeah. what, uh, what else did you guys catch out there? You know, so the other day um, we went for Wahoo. Right, which, oh, yeah. is, which in Hawaii is Ono, and yeah. Ono means delicious, right? Because mm -hmm. you can sashimi it, you can, uh, you know, sear it, and I mean, it, it doesn't matter what you do with it; it's good. <clears throat> Did and you guys? So, you guys kept those and ate them? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the thing with really getting dialed in on Oahu, it's it's a near shore fishery. These fish are in there, and they are just absolutely schooled up and eating mackerel um, like crazy. And, uh, you know, you're trolling a spread of about six lures, mostly bullet style. And these things come up and they're just absolutely missiles. As soon as that fish gets ready to take off, it excretes a slime that covers its body because as, he, as it gets ready to go for prey, it needs to be as streamlined as possible. And so that fish takes off and it's going 65 miles an hour towards that lure or yeah. towards its prey. Unbelievable. And it hits and the reel just explodes and starts screaming, you know, and then... If you look at some of these pictures, you're going to see they have better teeth. It looks like this fish went to the orthodontist because these are razor sharp teeth lined up one after the next. I mean, it perfect is this, row. The perfect row. Yeah. Perfect row. They are straight <laughs> apex predator. Um, and so, you know, luckily we got into a couple of them and uh, got to bring some home for a meal. It is absolutely phenomenal. Huh. But um, yeah, Kona is a special place down there. Yeah, no I mean, it's, it's big game fishing. It's only the biggest fish. You know, the reels, you know, you look at some of the boats and you look at some of the reels on the boats and the reels are worth more than the boat. Unbelievable. Because they're fishing 130 class reels. Yeah. Okay. Um, you don't play that game with a little, a little fish wide yeah this is this is a big game experience here we're so. gonna change your mic out at the break yeah <laughs> but we're gonna get through this so i appreciate everybody uh weighing in yeah he is uh he is cutting in and out a little bit here so um let's uh quickly before we wrap up let's talk a little bit about hunt you packed your bow with you i did yeah and I you did. got out in a couple days you did a competition shoot first of all i did then you got out on some animals yeah yeah so you know down there so so and this is an advice i would give to to any hunter in the pacific northwest or really anywhere in any western state is that 
when your when your elk season's over and your deer season's over, it's pretty much you know you hang up the gear, and you're you're waiting until next year to pursue that two week opportunity, right? Yeah. Hawaii is the off season mecca for hunting. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. It's it's year round hunting. You're hunting uh, species that are actually invasive to the island. So you're hunting pigs. You're hunting goats. You know you're hunting Hawaiian black sheep. Um, they even have mouflon sheep. They've got axis deer on a couple of the islands. They've got black-tailed deer on Kauai. Yeah. Okay. And so you've really got a, a plethora of opportunities to go chase. Um, and I had the opportunity to get on some pigs and some goats. Um, and I tell you what, it's one of those things. So the day that I shot um, that goat, which had a, you know, was about, you know, 24 inch on the curl to give you an idea of the size. Yeah. When I shot that goat, that morning I had caught that wahoo. Oh. So we went fishing in the morning. We had a charter, a four hour charter. No kidding. Got off the boat and headed to, um, you know, a local ranch uh -huh. and uh, shot that guy around. I think it was around four, four, four thirty in the afternoon. It's like you're walking on lava fields. It, it is a lava field. Uh -huh. It is a lava field. Yeah. I tell you what. So we hunted with um, one of the kids um, that worked the ranch, 14 year old, actually the youngest bull rider in the state of Hawaii. We got to hunt with him and he was kind of like our, our pseudo guide. Who's he's who we went with. And I tell you what, I when I shot that goat, Okay, that that goat was getting ready to, you know, basically bed and, and, and die. And um, I couldn't believe it because as soon as I shot it, I'm like, okay, got it. And then the kid takes off after the goat. And I'm thinking, what the heck is going on? Right. You know, and this kid ran over that lava and it's hard to get, if you can see in that picture, there's rocks everywhere. Oh yeah. I mean, he ran over, he ran over that like lava. Over river he, rock he is ran, tough enough, right? Yeah, he ran over that lava like Usain Bolt running the 100 yard dash. <laughs> I, I'm kidding you just not. Just as smooth as and can he be. Just, he did, the goat disappeared over the hill. He yeah. disappeared over the hill. He ended up body slamming that goat 200 yards later. What? I'm not lying. <laughs> He what? chased that sucker down and he Is put that him, what they do? He put him on the, well, I, I guess. I mean, I've never <laughs> done that before. You know, and so I saw I him. There's a picture of it on his shoulder on one of those photos. Yeah, so there he's is. He's packing it back to you, right? Yeah. Oh, this kid, this kid's legit. <laughs> he's like your goat Sherpa. This, he's, he is legit, man. Tough, oh. tough kid. Kind of reminds me of my nephew in South Dakota. He's a bull rider. And he's a bull rider okay. as well. Okay. And um, I, I tell you what, I saw that. I saw him run off. I'm like, okay, we got to get this goat. I start running and then I go, Oh, this is stupid. I can't do this. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to run over the lava. Uh, uh, and, this is stupid. I just, I just paused. Big man um, don't run on lava. No, no, no. Big man walks slowly on lava. Yeah. But, um, y you know, there's opportunities like this every day on the big island. I you know mean, what I like the, is you just talked about, you went and um, you get out there on the charter, have an amazing yeah. morning of fishing, and then you go yeah. stick an arrow in a goat in the afternoon. Right. Yep. It's just, I mean, gosh, you know, what would would you polish the end of the day off with? What kind of drink? <laughs> a little tequila? Oh, my tequila. Yeah, Atta kid. yeah the, there you, you go. The usual. Yeah, man, um, that looks like a great trip. So it's just, it's phenomenal. The, the, the only thing I'll say, though, is is arrows are expensive, okay? Yeah. And in Hawaii, one arrow, that's like shooting a bullet. You're not going to get that bullet back and reload it into that casing, okay? That, that arrow is done. It goes through <laughs> that animal, especially when you're shooting an 85-pound bow. Uh -huh. It goes through that animal, hits the lava rock, and explodes. Oh, yeah. And it is game it's over. It's not going in the dirt in Hawaii, no, right? No. 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 So that, that's the only thing that's that I would say funny. is you better bring plenty of arrows. Bring plenty of arrows. A little yeah. easier to check your uh, arrow uh, case onto the airplane than a gun. Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah. 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 I mean, I, and I, I was surprised, but even, even at Alaska, they were like, is this a gun? I was like, no, it's a bow. And they go, oh, okay. Are you sure it's and not they, a gun, sir? But, but it <laughs> shoots things, right? And it's like, yeah, but there's no firearm. There's no ignition source. There's no primer. And it took, they had to check with a couple people to make sure that they didn't have to check it through the, the special check station. But doesn't this shoot something? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the well, look I got. kind of, yeah, yeah. Like, no, it's just for looks, it's a decorative piece. Perfect. Well, uh, nicely done, man. It looks like yeah. you guys had a great time. No, had beautiful. some uh, Had some uh, great weather, you got your little tan going on. Yeah. Now you're back to reality, rain and gloom. I know, huh? I know, I wish I was Welcome back home. there. All right, uh, we are gonna jump out for a quick break. Thank you for that, sir. Um, we're going to check in with our buddy uh, Ian Winder, uh, All Rivers and Saltwater Charters. You know, bottom fishing out at Westport is pretty darn good. Yes, it is. They got a lot of decent sized lings mm -hmm. for uh, not having to go out to the deep water yeah. as of yet because it's not open. But uh, the uh, the inner part of where they are targeting, the lings look pretty uh, pretty healthy. Yeah. And, there's and a they've had a good weather window, too. Oh, man. Yeah. 
Talk about weather. So, yeah, uh, Ian Winder, uh, All Rivers and Saltwater Charters, when we come back right here at Fish Out Northwest. Co. and Outdoor Emporium is the largest local outfitter in the Northwest since 1975, providing thousands of people affordable outdoor gear. This summer, make your next outdoor adventure more affordable by shopping at our warehouse style pricing. We are a local Scotty dealer offering sales, service, and repair. Located in Fife and Seattle, come visit us today. The outdoors await you. It's easier than ever to browse homes and connect with an agent on the go with Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate's mobile app. With the app, your home search is synced across all of your devices, so you can pick up your home search anytime, anywhere. Take full advantage of an enriched, mobile-optimized map search experience. Use location services to quickly find homes near you that match your search criteria. Draw your own map boundaries to find homes in a specific area, and apply layers to view school districts, neighborhoods, zip codes, and more. The app's user-friendly design makes it easier than ever to find a home you'll love. Narrow down your search results, save your search criteria, and save your favorite homes. You can browse your saved homes in a list view that puts photos and key details, like price and square footage, right at your fingertips. Or check out your saved homes displayed on the map. Yep, for sure. Oh yeah, big fish. Yeah, buddy. Nice fish. Beauty. Gorgeous fish. Bobby's on the board. We got a good one. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, geez, come on. Nice fish. Nice fish. Welcome back, Fish on Northwest here in Studio Dwayne England. Tommy Donlin finally back from his escapades <laughs> afar and uh, rubbing it in our face, of course, as he does. Uh, I want to welcome back to the program Ian Winder of All Rivers and Saltwater Charters, a.k.a. Strawberry Shortcake, is uh, in the house <laughs> and uh, joining us as per usual. Man, uh, always great to get you on. And it looks like the bottom fishing out of Westport from opening day and plus that amazing weather window we hit. You guys have been flat out getting it done. How's the, how's it starting off for you? Uh, it's been actually, it's been great. You know, we've dealt with a little bit of weather. It is the spring, but what days we have been able to get on the water has been phenomenal. Uh, the weather's gone from terrible to absolutely gorgeous. So the days we've been able to get out on the water have been phenomenal. Uh, just great oceans, light winds, and the fishing's been great. Uh, some of the greatest lingcod catches we've seen, just ferocious fishing. Uh, for link hodge, but any at all depths, whether you want to catch them in 40 feet of water or 300 feet of water, they're they're biting good. Mm. Yeah, so you mentioned something that's that's kind of critical to your tactics, Ian, and I think that's depth. Can you describe for people, you know, so okay, you're chasing them in 40. What do your tactics look like when you're in 40 feet of water, mm -hmm. and what do they look like if you're in 300 feet of water? You know, for us, we love using live bait, and we can take that live bait anywhere. We can take that we can take a flounder and we can drop it in 40 feet of water and we can also drop it in 800 feet of water and we can catch a lingcod. Mm. Um, but what's nice is when you get into some of that shallower stuff, you start getting in a little bit less than 80 feet of water. Your, your array of options completely open up. If you want to use a dart or a small jig or a little swim bait or a small grub, they'll just gobble up anything you put in front of them. It's pretty great. Um, as you go a little bit deeper, that's where your, your live bait, your pipe jigs, your larger offerings seem to work really, really well. Um, but for us, we usually try to take live bait wherever we can because it's 
it's just too much fun. Absolutely. And so for, for yeah. everybody's information, when you're talking live bait, you're talking uh, sand dabs, AKA small flounder, correct? Yep. yep that is right. correct. Yep. And it's, you know, big, big thing for us on the coast, we just got opened up to five flounder, which was, yep. you know, a big increase for us. So oh, that's yeah. not including our nine bottom fish limit. So yeah. mm-hmm. we get so, five additional flat fish. Yeah. And so before, so for people that don't know before, um, everybody had to be really careful about how many flounder you had on board because it went against your bottom fish limit. Yep. And so in order to make sure that you were legal, you had to, you know, count your flounder and then count your bottom fish. Right. Mm-hmm. And some of these yep. flounder, I mean, you know, the, you catch a link cod and the flounder, he survived that blow yeah. amazingly, yeah. Yeah. you know, and you throw him yeah. back down and he's going to get eaten again. So you really had to manage the, um, manage the numbers. So now that's a little bit easier with the new regulation. That's good to see. Yeah. It's much easier. A couple of years ago, we got lifted to three. So we had three, yep. three extra, extra fish per person. And that's right. really, that's really what we're shooting for. We're looking for three flounder per person should, should be enough. And less fishing is tough. You'll start going through them as you start losing gear and things mm-hmm. like that. But most of the time, three flounder is plenty per person. You ever find the ling cod off the bite? Yes, a- absolutely. Talk a little actually. bit about that because most people assume that ling cod are such a ambush predatory type fish that you put something down in their wheelhouse. It's just hammer time. There's no question. You're going to get them every time. But that's, not necessarily the case, and if so, what what actually changes that might put them off the bite? I wish I could answer that one hundred percent. That would be great. Okay, uh, joining we, us I, next week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, you said you had an answer for yeah, us. Yeah, I thought we did. Yeah. Well, I can make that enough. Yeah. You know, over over the years, we've seen where these, the, especially the link cod, they they'll they'll bite really really good for you know three maybe mm. four days, so they'll just be ferocious, mm. and all of a sudden they just they shut down. It's just yeah. you, you go to the same same areas, same depth, same zones, or you've been finding them day after day, and you can't get them to bite. Or if you do get them to bite, even a live bait, it is a it is a nibble. Mm. It drops it, it lets go, and it never comes back, which is not the typical link cod behavior. You know, right? Have you um, ever correlated that Ian to drift speed or drift direction? Uh, I I want to believe all of that. Um, I definitely find that when the currents are lacking and especially like on the Washington coast, it, it cannot just be tidal. We'll have a current that'll go a direction for days and it'll run hard. Mm. If the current's really, really strong, it makes things difficult, but also if the currents are really, really light, the bite seems to slow down. It yeah, makes sense. Keep that water moving. Um, the other day, uh, we had, we've had phenomenal link cod fishing and the other day it just completely shut down. The wind uh. shifted from the east and, it just, it got, I mean, completely, we had to scratch out our fish. We got them. Mm-hmm. Boy, it was a lot of work. And I don't know if the thing, you know, went from the east, fish by the least. I don't like to believe that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But I, I had it running through my head all day. I'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen that too. And and that's that's a tough decision to make when you're halibut fishing too. Because when you're in an area where you yeah. know there's some high quality halibut and you're pounding the bottom and nothing's happening, you got a decision to make. Do you leave that area? you know, with, with former knowledge that, you know, those fish are there yep. or do you just grind it out knowing that the bite will turn on at, at some, some point, point, right? Yeah. yeah. It's tough. It's, it's tough. It's tough. Cause you can jump from rock to rock to rock or structure, 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 and all of a sudden find one that just wants to cooperate. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see that with the black rock fish populations off the coast a lot. Um, especially, um, May and June, we get a, a crab spawn and there's just uh, the whole water system is just filled with food and you'll find thousands of rockfish that will not cooperate, mm. will not bust it. They're just you'll jump from school yeah. to school to school yeah. to school, and all of a sudden you find one school, and it's wiped out. Uh. And it's no different than any other school, but for some reason, that group wants to cooperate. Speaking of uh, other bottom fish opportunities like that, so what uh, what kind of depths are you talking when you're targeting the rockfish? And, uh, you know, if folks are going out, Maybe this season they're looking at weather windows and they're like, you know, it looks like it's going to be pretty nice out there. I'm going to finally run my boat out there and see if we can't go get some rockfish or some bottom fish. What, what type of depths should they be looking for? What type of structure should they be looking at when they're going to target those rockfish? You know, in, I'd say majority of the time what you're going to see out of the West Fort and area, two areas, you're going to find usually good schools and good areas of rockfish on any hard bottom or any rock structure from about 60 feet to 180 feet of water. Mm-hmm. Majority of that happening in 120 to 
70 feet of water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you are dealing with a big ocean swell or if there's been a big swell for a period of days, it seems like some of that really, really shallow stuff, like 40 to 60 foot rock, if you know any, it seems like they get cleared out. Like those fish don't want to deal with that swell. They tend to slide out to deeper water. Um, Something we've dealt with this year, and this is all theory in my head, but right out the gate, we've had a little bit slower uh, rock fishing, a little mm. bit slower on the black rock fish, not very cooperative. Not something we typically see till like, for later seasons. The water's really cold out there. I don't know if that's the key or not, but oh. it's about 48 degrees. Mm. That's, um, that's a good just, sign, though. Cold yeah, water? It, yeah. 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 So the fish are really lethargic. You know, you see a lot of private guys out there fishing rock fish, and they're jigging, and they're jigging really hard. They're fishing mm. darts or grubs, and they're putting a lot of erratic action into it. And they're not getting bit. They're not. They're still catching fish, but not at the volumes we could if you just slow down. Right. So you, usually, even just dead sticking that bait, hit the bottom, come up five cranks, you're hammered. hold your bait, don't move it. Just let the ocean do the work. You don't get bit. Maybe come up another five feet, work through that school of fish, mm. find a biter. But it seems like less is more. If you really put a lot of action into it, you're not getting bit. And the bites can be really, really subtle. Imagine almost like perch fish. Right. The weight comes off the rod tip. Can't say so, I've done a lot of that. Kind of but hey, the question. So you talked about the hard bottom. What what sonar system do you have in your boat? And how if, if somebody's going out, like what do you see on your sonar? You drive over an area and you go, Oh, that's a hard bottom. How do you know it's a hard bottom? How does that work? It can be it can be really tricky. Um, I really like when I'm bottom fishing running that Ray Marine, that chirp. Um, either the CP100 or the 200. I really think that gives me a really, really good image of the bottom, especially in the down vision. Mm-hmm. But, you know, really learning your electronics and learning and watching that the density line, that red line, essentially, at the, at, it shows you the bottom and how dense it gets. You know? And did you say, I'm sorry, did you say you're running it at high chirp? Yeah, I, I, I like the medium chirp myself because it seems to work through a lot of depth, but... Um, the high chirp works great, but I definitely like that chirp system, especially the down vision. That'll really show you what's going on. Mm. Um, but most of the time, if you're going to find a hard bottom, especially in the shallower aspect out there, the hard bottom comes with structure. So you're going to see a rise and fall on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And you get out some of the deeper stuff, you know, some of that four or 500 foot range, there's areas out there where it's hard bottom, but it doesn't change. It just, just Flat. the content of the bottom changes. And that's kind of hard to pick out sometimes. But all the stuff inshore, you're going to see it. You're going to see a, a drastic change in the bottom typically. Mm-hmm. And usually, like, if you're fishing rockfish, you can see them really, really well on the screen. Yep. And also, if you're fishing ring cod, if you find rockfish, the chances are you're going to find ring cod there. Mm-hmm. Not always, but if you find rockfish, there's, there's what you need for ring cod there as well. Yeah, I, I concur. You know, that's one of the things that I think is totally underutilized on a lot of people's boats is the sonar. And if you, oh, if, if, you if you, especially when bottom fishing, yeah. you know, and people think, you know, and a lot of people, they started maybe boating and fishing 30 years ago, maybe 50 oh, years yeah. ago, right? You know, um, the retirees out there today, they're 60 to 70, 80 years old, right? They didn't have the technology that we have today. And so you get in the mindset of, I've got a GPS waypoint. I know I can catch rockfish there. I know I can catch lingcod there. I'm going to the point. Mm-hmm. Well, they're not, they're I, not always there. They're not, <laughs> yeah, number one, they're not always there. But number yeah, two, if you got your sonar game dialed in mm-hmm. with the right electronics and you are cruising out there at 25 knots, you can tell when the bottom changes composition. Mm-hmm. You can see yep. those rises and falls that Ian's talking about. Yeah. And yeah. so you're going to find spots that you never thought of finding oh, I'm before. here. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. I tell you, I can't yeah. tell you how many big halibut I find on spots like uh, that yeah. while cruising because I'm paying attention to the sonar. Yeah, good yeah. point. Even, yeah. even playing around with your scroll speed a lot, I find when I'm bottom fishing, slowing down that scroll speed can really show you a lot more than mm. what was there before. Another Taking your sonar from 100% scroll speed even down to 80 will have shown me rockfish schools that I didn't even know were there. I didn't huh. see the first pass. Right but on. Slowing the speed cool. down on, on the scroll, huge difference. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Hey, uh, you guys are typically booked up pretty solid out there. Uh, you got any openings coming up in the near or short future? And uh, how long is that? How long is that bottom fish season run? For those that don't know, so we, we'll have a our, our operation will target bottom fish uh, all the way through June. Um, what's really cool is the first two weeks of June, uh, we have 
essentially an unlimited depth almost. Right. Um, we'll be out that there, opens by up. The way. Yeah, we'll June, see you out there. June fifth, buddy. Um, you can you can plan on us arriving in Westport. <laughs> so that's a really cool time. But fishing's great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, all, all the time. But we do have openings, uh, some weekend openings, and and some weekend uh, weekday openings as well. Okay, got four boats going, so there's there's some spaces available for guys who want to get out. Best uh, opportunity, for folks, get a hold of you. Yeah, you can go through either the website, uh, allwashingtonfishing.com, um, or even through the Facebook page as well. So yeah. All rivers and saltwater charters. That works fantastic. Always a pleasure, yeah. my friend. Awesome. Thanks, guys. All right. Yeah, good talk, Dave. Have you. a great evening. All right. We'll see you soon. We'll talk to you later. All right. All right. Ian Winder, one of the best out there, man. Yeah, he is. And great, great guy. Fun just to be really around. Good guy. Fun to be around. He yep. could be on the boat next to you. You know what? He's yeah. he's forcing you to have a good time. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you start throwing sand dabs at each other. Yeah. <laughs> Things like yeah. that. <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh, yeah. Oh, that I good. pulled We're a pin have... on the sand dab grenade and woo! <laughs> Butterfly. Uh, hey, Mike Serdik is tuning in tonight. He's asking, he me, what's the status of the boat? What's the yeah. I'm like, well, Mike, what you know. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting on a couple electronic screens, by God. And uh, as soon as those get there, yeah. mount it in. Because everything else is waiting, man. It's just a plug and play at this point. Get it out on the water, test all the systems, and we are good to go. You're, you're going to be blown away by the Raymarine Axiom Pro. I can't so. wait. I'm, I'm telling you, it is it is. I a, cannot wait. You know, I know people say this, but, I mean, it is a game changer. It is a game changer in all the fisheries that we do, and especially tuna fishing. Well, it's a full-on change of electronics for me from what yeah. I had on my previous right. boat. So I got a lot to learn, right? I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. It's like, this is going to be fantastic. Mm-hmm. Oh, it never stopped learning, right? I have mm-hmm. you. Uh, that's going to take me a long way in that regard. We're also going to get Bike Certic out on the boat, yep. and we are not just going to walk me through the process. We're going to create a library of tutorials. Yes. Let all these you know little snippets of how tos, five, eight, ten minute little okay mm-hmm. windows in time on how you maximize the performance of electronics. How I really make that uh, autopilot tied in with my electronics work for me while I'm mm-hmm. on these different troll fisheries. Whether we're talking, yes, Tommy. Kokanee on the east side of the state, mm-hmm. or Chinook salmon out in mm-hmm. uh, out in uh, Puget Sound, or yeah. any of the fisheries we're doing out of uh, the Columbia. So, so much to come in the realm of electronics and blowing up the Ray Marine opportunities that uh, we have our have our uh, hooks into. This is going to be good stuff. Absolutely, so I I'm can't excited. wait. Yeah, I am too. Gonna gonna be great. So, all right, gonna jump out for a quick break. We come back. Oh, uh, you know what? I should uh, check out. I believe we're talking to Shane. We are. We got going on. You know, there is a springer fishery that's happening now. Um, Though the uh, social medias, as it were, are not blown up with as many springer uh, pictures as we're seeing as, say, I don't know, lingcod, Mm -hmm. for example, Mm -hmm. right? The springer uh, this time of year is is almost like a Sasquatch. So um, (laughs) if you're lucky enough to find one, it may be worth a whole ton of money. Uh, Shane's been out there grinding it a bit. Let's face it, the water is cold. 42 to 44 degrees, not really conducive to a lot of Springer activity. Um, we had Cameron Black in here last week. We talked a little bit about Springers at the break and stuff. And you know, it's a waiting game and it's a window of opportunity. We need the water temperatures to warm up a bit. We need mm-hmm. the fish to start migrating up river. Um, gosh, you know, with the lack of uh, catch on Springers right now, do we dare say we may see a bumped pass April 4th? It all depends on this next week and a half as we get into that very front edge of April and what those four days in April, that that mm-hmm. April season of four days, woo, look out, mm-hmm. uh, things could get crazy. So we'll talk to Shane about what's been going on, what conditions he uh, experienced while he was on the waters, when he's coming back to get back on these springers and what the future holds. All that in the Columbia River and, uh, and the uh, Willamette Springer Fishery, as it were, or as it is, as we come back right here, Fish Out Northwest.
A Northwest favorite for almost 40 years, Arima boats are manufactured with pride right here in Bremerton, Washington. Arima Boats offers all of our boats with Honda outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty from your Honda outboard. With literally thousands of Arima boats on the water throughout the Pacific Northwest, Arima boats are a proven hull design that offers incredible fuel economy and all of the amenities that a serious angler is looking for. All Arima boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why we back our boats with a lifetime warranty. All of our Arima boats are designed to maximize deck space while also providing ample seating. Contact us today at Arima Boats for all your boating needs and let us help you get out on the water. Hold on. Hold That's up. on me. Wait a minute. Guess what I didn't do? We got talking at the break and uh, you got me off of uh, mute? There we go. Ring a dingy. <laughs> Let's hope he answers. We're talking about Springers at the break. Hello. Hey, there you are. Guess what? Hey. We're not, yeah. on, we're not on the commercial break. We're actually we back live. live in studio. We got caught up in conversation. I forgot to dial you up. Yes. Uh, no worries. Bonehead. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. I was just watching Fish Hunt live on Facebook. Oh, so it's working. It's actually getting out there this evening. How about that? I love it when technology and a plan comes together. Good things will happen. So, hey, thanks for taking uh, time this evening. Shane Magnuson, for everybody tuning in. Upper Columbia Guide Service. Uh, Shane, you're no stranger to the show. We appreciate every time you take time to uh, join us. So, uh, hey, we're going to talk a little springer fishing. You drug your boat over here to kind of the west side uh, Columbia River stretch and we're on the water this last week um, was it what you expected or was it uh, oh look at that in front and center or was it uh, a little lackluster for this time of year what do you think um, I think we're a, a little lackluster. Uh, I'm not eating spring Chinook tonight, if that tells everybody <laughs> <Good point. laughs> what's going on. Right. Um, uh, it kind of like we talked about yesterday, there was some things playing against us, um, this last weekend when we were down there in the Cat Flamet area, uh, there's fish starting to show up, but we should be a little bit further ahead of what we are, I think. Yeah, do you think it's uh, you think part of it is water uh, conditions and temperature? Forty two, perhaps where you're at, forty four. Uh, we got uh, Don sitting here saying forty four degrees out of uh, Caterpillar, so kind of still on the chill side, don't you think? Yeah, it, it's pretty darn cold. It was when we got down there uh, a week ago Thursday. Now it was forty two down there at Cath Lambert, so um, that's pretty chilly for those fish to want to really start moving or or be active yet. I think and. Um, the other thing I've noticed is the Columbia is still really low and clear. We, mm. the dams haven't really been pushing water. Um, so the current we have down there is all just by tidewater movement, well, which is, uh, hasn't really got anything active yet either. So interesting. So uh, what, what temp are we looking for, by the way? So it's 42, 44. You looking for 50 Shane, 52 higher. It, you know, we're we're almost there. Forty five to forty eight, these fish really start to snap. Um, if you look at past years dam counts over Bonneville, you really start to see the numbers climb when it hits forty eight. That's that forty eight degrees kind of the magic mark when you're like, Oh, all of a sudden we've got a thousand fish a day going over the dam. Um, so that's kinda that's kinda what we're looking for. Um you know, when it hits that 50 degree mark, it opens up the game to a whole uh, different aspect of gear of what they'll eat, but uh, they'll start biting and eating herring and things when it's cold. You just have to slow it down and be patient. Let's talk about that transition of gear selection. Nice segue, by the way. So looking at temperatures right now, we get to that optimal 48 to 50. Where, where's that transitional line when you're you're basically running bait indoor and now we're going to start running some spinners or we're going to change up to something else, um, prawn spinner or whatever it is you're going to run? How do you make that determination? And based on the clarity of the water right now, does that change your color in presentation versus, say, last year at this time? Uh, yeah, a couple things. So clarity-wise, uh, we'll start with that. It, 
what I notice is when the water's real clear, um, I, I'm always using a lot of blues and greens and chartreuses and green dot stuff. And, and that this time, of, when the water's real clear this time of year. Uh, but what I do change a lot is uh, my leader length. When the water's real clear, we'll, we'll lengthen out our leaders quite a ways, uh, get it away from that fish splash or, or what have you, uh, kind of make it so it's not so right in their face. Um, and then as the water dirties up later in the spring, uh, we'll shorten up those leaders, snug it up closer to that fish flasher, or as we transition into pro trolls, um, snug it up closer to that flasher so they can so they can see the bait when they get that up there close. Um, so that's that's really the biggest changes I probably do. Uh, these, these springers, they, they love greens and, and pinks and, and blues and chromes and that normal stuff. Um, that 50 degree mark, that's kind of your magic mark. You know, we're, we're, we'll get them on plugs right now. They'll sit down there on anchor and catch them on plugs or, or we'll downhill trolling uh, a herring or, or hooded bait of some sort um, real slow as much as we can. And then when you kind of hit that 50 degree mark, you'll start to see that transition where, you know, they'll start snapping on prawn spinners and, and you'll see the, uh, the hard lure bite if we're running spin fish or something like that, that's come out this last year. Uh, we'll switch up to start using more pro trolls where we have more action because the water's a little warmer and gets them a little more aggressive. Um, so you start to see that transition really at the 50 degree mark. And then just the, for the bear spinner fishermen, uh, I say 55. Um, and then you can kind of go away from having a shrimp uh, behind it and start just pulling those straight spinners at 55 degrees and, and do just as well too. So um, that's your, your transition line really throughout the spring. Yeah, and uh, speak of spinners, so what size? Is that like a 3.5? And is that a choice over, say, any other type of uh... – uh, hardware such as you know you're gonna you're gonna run any spin fish I know a lot of guys are looking at that spin fish with the ability to pack it with tuna and we know how much springers uh, react to the scent of tuna so that's a good option uh, or a um, you know a brads uh, some type of uh, cup plug back behind there what what's your go-to choice or do you have multiple options behind the uh, 360 we have multiple options. Um, I would say early part of the season, if I, if I do run some three sixties down there, uh, which to be honest with you, that lower river is probably gonna be closed before we kind of see the three sixty bike take off. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that the river will hit 50 degrees by the time, by the time we're done fishing down there. But, um, uh, if we do run three sixties, a lot of spin fish, uh, a lot of prawn spinners with uh, 3.5 blades, um, those those 3.5 mulky blades they, mm-hmm. uh, that came out last year were fantastic on the springers, on those prawn spinners. Um, and that's what I'll what I'll mostly throw at them. Uh, if the water does get real dirty, though, I will uh, I'll throw a bigger blade and go back to a fish flash and get that. Uh, either I, I like a size five when the water gets real dirty mm. and uh, get that thing thumping down there. They find that vibration. Um, and that's more later in the spring if we're fishing at Drano or something. But Maybe um, quickly, uh, because you touched on that size five, talk about why we don't run that larger spinner blade with, say, a 360 presentation. You go back to that inline fish flash. Yeah, so the, the reason we don't run that bigger blade behind the 360 is that – once you get uh, over a 3.5 blade, you get that size four, four and a half, or five. They just have too much drag, and it doesn't allow that that 360 flasher to to make that roll, to to put that snap on that lure like what it's designed for. It's just too much drag behind it. Yeah. You have to run smaller stuff. Um, so that's why I jump back to the fish flash. That way, I still have you know have a flasher down there putting off some some flash, but I can put down a big blade that. Uh, is putting out a lot more vibration than that three and a half size blade. Gotcha. Well, uh, we still got some season left. Uh, probably by the time you get back on the water here in a few days, the uh, the smelt uh, should be tapering off considerably. You know, there's been a few Springer caught with uh, multiple smelt in the belly. So guys have been sending me photos and reports, which is interesting. A lot of folks, and you and I talked about this the other day, they think Springer stop eating once they hit the river, Tommy, but. Uh, you know what, them smelter in the mm-hmm. river, they're opportunistic. They got a long ways to go until they spawn. They're gonna to continue to eat. They're still in tidal influenced water. Yep. So to that salmon, 
uh, mm-hmm. with that tide influence and the fact that they're migrating, they're still going to, you know, them still right there in their face. Right. So they're hitting those, but uh, it's uh, it'll get kind of down to the wire, Shane. If you, if you don't, if we don't see these numbers go up, and we get to those first four days of uh, April, and we haven't hit the numbers, you think uh, you think we'll get any type of an extension this year based on those numbers? You know, it's it's really hard to say. You know, it's all about that uh, that impact. Uh, the escape, meeting the escapement yeah. and our impacts. And if we, if they're still confident, we're going to get the fish they say we're going to, and we haven't reached our impacts, we could see a couple extra days at it. But, um, you know, it, it just all depends on the movement of the fish and, yep. and how well we do as fishermen, I guess. Yeah. So. Good point. But you know, anytime <laughs> we go deeper into April, uh, as recreational law opportunistic, we are, uh, we are grateful for our April days, no doubt about it. So, um, That's right. Hey, any openings coming up for your days that you're going to finish out here before you move back up river on your uh, springer season? <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, I do have a couple days open actually right there at the first of April, which is oh. going to be the, the best time for this. Um, uh, I've pushed uh, most of my days off to, to those last uh, eight, nine, ten days because I think it's going to be the best fishing. And, yep. and there's a couple days right there available. Okay, and folks can contact you where to get those uh, get those seats booked. Um, call me anytime on my phone number, uh, 509-630-5433. Uh, go on my website, UpperColumbiaGuide.com. Um, also, you can find me on Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. Upper Columbia River uh, Guide Service, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, uh, great information. As always, appreciate you jumping on and sharing your knowledge and info. And uh, I'm still banking on the fact we're going to get together and come out and do uh, do a day or two of walleye fishing with you, get some of that uh, footage to bring back here in studio and show the folks. So I can't wait to get into that in some May, nice sunny weather and some walleye on the table. Me too. Latter part of May. Let's plan on it. You got it, buddy. All right. Have a great uh, evening, and we'll stay in touch. All right. Thanks, Wayne. Yeah, you bet. See you. Bye. So I have fished with Shane multiple times. September when we've been over at uh, over at Fish Camp, over on the, towards the east side out of the Dells, uh, fishing out in front of the shoots or out in front of the click tat. And uh, whether we're rolling the 360s and the and in the uh, 3.5 spinners or uh, running bait or whatever it is we're doing hover fishing we just whack and stack chinook with that guy especially mm-hmm. i mean there's a reason he has upper columbia river guide service because that's basically his home specialty waters. Yep. yeah and he is so dialed up there and whether it, uh you know he was doing the kokanee stuff for quite a while too and um he's just an all-around great guy you have a lot of fun good guide if you guys want to go get a springer and have him book the seat as he said which is a rarity to that have is rare. A I was surprised to hear that day or two in April, the first of April, when it, when we get those four mm-hmm. days in April, and there's a reason they narrow you down to four days in April because that's when you slam them. Man, that's when that bulk yeah. of fish are coming in. Water conditions should still be uh, ideal. I would get on the phone with Shane and book that seat before it gets taken because he mm-hmm. is going to put springers in the boat uh, as he gets back down the water in this next ten days or so, mm-hmm. guaranteed. So, all right, we're going to jump out. Tommy, uh, back in studio, back in the hot seat, my friend. We have some CQ blackmouth opportunity, yeah. of which Josh and I are heading out this next week. We'll have our final guest on after the after the bait lab se- uh, segment, uh, Matt Messing of Mess Around Charters. He's been out there at CQ, had a phenomenal couple of days on blackmouth and link cod and rockfish, right? So we're mm-hmm. going to go take advantage of that with... Matt, but before we get there, you have some insightful information. We still have blackmouth opportunity through we do. April 30th. Yep, and okay. it's really good, by the way, guys. I mean, and, and there's some there's some big fish being caught there at CQ. There are some big fish. 17, yeah. 18 pound fish. So. It's not just five and six pounders, man. Yep. It's it's impressive. The real there, are, there are guys that are, you get two fish, yep. which is fantastic. So you got a two fish limit on blackmouth uh, out there at CQ. It's open through April 30th. Tommy's going to walk you through his process on some things you need to know and do to be successful on that CQ blackmouth fishery. So don't go anywhere. Stick through the break. We come back. We'll be in the bait lab with Thomas Donlin on CQ blackmouth right here. Fish on Northwest. Allied boats are built by West Coast fishermen for West Coast fishermen. Deep V 21 degree dead rise at the transom guarantees a smooth ride no matter the conditions. 
Allied offers all of our boats with Honda outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty from your Honda outboard. Allied boats range from 19 to 32 foot in length, so no matter what type of heavy gauge boat you are looking for, we have it for you. All of our Corsair 21 foot and larger designs come standard with reverse chine that is welded inside and out with no extrusions below the waterline, so that you will never have to worry about corrosion problems down the road. Get out on the water today in a boat that you can trust and enjoy with Allied Boats. Contact us at Allied Boats today to learn much more about our incredible fishing machines. New days. New beginnings. New friends. New loves. New dreams. New goals. New scenery. New job. No matter what the next chapter holds, Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate will be there to help you find the new that's right for your lifestyle at any stage of your life. Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. Expect better. Welcome back to Fish on Northwest. I'm Tommy Donlin. We are in the bait lab talking saltwater today. We are going to cover how to fish for blackmouth or your juvenile Chinook salmon. This is brought to you by Max Lure. Go check them out at maxlure.com. Okay, so on the table, the first thing I want to talk about is downrigger fishing because if you want to cover water and you're blackmouth fishing, let's face it, these are feeding juvenile Chinook salmon. So they are looking for bait and that's what you should be looking for too. And once you find that bait, most likely you're gonna be able to capitalize on that area because that's what those fish are feeding on. So the first thing is you gotta cover ground. Well, it's hard to do that jigging, okay? Now, if you've got a well-established area, you have a very specific area where those fish are holding, hey, jigging's a great way to go or mooching. But the first thing I wanna talk about today is trolling. Okay, so if we look at the table, the first thing we're gonna look at is the downrigger setup. So I've got a 15 pound downrigger ball here and we really don't run much less than that unless you're running a third rigger and then you're going to go to maybe that middle rigger and that's going to be a 12 pound ball. But this is a 15 pound ball or a 20 pound ball. If you're running the Scotty 2106s, okay, or you're running the uh, Digitroll Cannons, you have a lot more capability and you can run and get away with that 20 pound ball. And I'll tell you what, if you can get away with that heavier ball, you want to do so because it really keeps your gear organized and separated. Okay, back to the table. So one of the things that you're going to notice right away is I've got the downrigger ball and then I've got a snubber connection, okay, to a rudder. This is a rudder um, or a fin, okay. Now I'll tell you what, there's two types of polymer that these snubbers are typically made out of unless you go with a commercial version that's, that's black. Typically, you're going to find these in blue and green. Okay, I'm going to pull one over into camera view here so you can see the green one. So I will tell you right now that the lifetime expectancy of the green one is a lot less than this blue polymer. So what you're going to notice is that I've reinforced um, this snubber with 300 pound test monofilament crimped. And you can tell that there's a little bit of slack in that monofilament because this polymer, this green piece stretches when you apply a downrigger ball to it. To it. Okay, this is a fail safe. If this green piece fails, I've got 300 pound. The reason I add it is because the 300 pound is not as nice on the hands when you go to grab the downrigger ball by the green snubber. Okay, so that's just a little detail there. Now, with blackmouth, in a lot of cases, you're always running on the bottom. 
okay? You're gonna be running your gear close, very close to the bottom, if not banging that downrigger ball against the bottom. Um, and the other thing is, so you're gonna be, you know, potentially in that deep water zone and you wanna have a side profile view of something that attracts that fish over to where your gear is, and that's this rudder, okay? Um, the other thing is you've got, you've got your flasher set up, okay? Now, your flasher is an intermittent flash in the water. If you think about a side profile view of the flasher, it's rotating. And so when it gets to the top or the bottom of its rotation, there's no flash. So it's almost like a blink. You see the, and in this case, and, and a lot of the, the flashers that we're using for black mouth, it's gonna have a glow side. So you look at any one of these flashers and it doesn't matter what brand of flasher you use, you're gonna have some sort of glow feature on one side. And depending on the flasher, you have a silver mylar, or you, maybe you have a glow on the other side. But as this thing rotates through the water, you're gonna see the glow side or the fish will see the glow side. And then it's gonna see the silver side and it's gonna flash back and forth, okay? You gotta always put your mind in terms of what that fish sees when it reacts and comes into your spread and it's the same thing if they're below your gear if you are running your gear off the bottom they're going to be seeing a flash and then the silver side but it's only intermittent the thing that's nice about a rudder is if they look off to one side they're going to always see this this thing doesn't rotate at all it's always a constant profile in the water and the other thing you're going to notice is this is dimpled Okay, this rudder's dimpled, so it's got a different nose, uh, noise profile as the water comes across the surface of this rudder. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if you're running like an all chrome rudder, it's definitely a light reflective rudder, okay? So that's number one, I'm pretty much always running a rudder. The other thing is I'm gonna have a release clip. Now I like to run long leashes on my release clips about four to six feet, something in that range, and that's gonna go off the end of the rudder. All right, so that is the very bottom end of the equation. Um, from there, let's talk a little bit more about flashers. So you've got your typical 360 flasher. Um, these ones are breakaway. And, you know, I was lucky enough to where I stockpiled Q Cove flashers when they were in production. They're not in production anymore, okay? Now, if you go back into the Fish on Northwest archives on YouTube, you're gonna find where Dwayne did a make your own breakaway flasher. You can follow that. We'll put the link in the description. But otherwise, um, I'm a big fan of breakaway flashers. When I hook a fish, I do not want this flasher coming into the equation. That's number one. Okay, now, if you are running um, a hoochie or you're running an ace high fly, okay, you have to put action into that, into that bait, into that lure because it doesn't have its own action. If you're running a spoon or you're running a bait, you can get away with your rotational flasher, okay, your fish flash. Um, and if I'm running, say I am running a three downrigger setup, or say I'm stacking gear, you have to think in terms of gear separation. If I'm putting two rods on one downrigger, um, if I put two big 360 degree flashers, and especially if I'm trolling deep and I've got a lot of blowback, there's a high likelihood that those flashers are gonna tangle when I'm in a turn situation. If you're going straight all day, like you're in the open ocean and you're only gonna go straight, you're gonna set the autopilot and you're gonna go and you don't have a cross current, hey, knock yourself out. But that those times are few and far between. And so we're usually always gonna uh, work one of these flashers, these fish flashes into the equation. The other thing that I'll tell you is this is gonna provide a different light profile, okay? So this thing is gonna spin at a higher revolution than your 360 degree flasher. So it's gonna give a totally different presentation. And we like to have at least one of these into in the spread because if we're running bait, this, this creates a totally different flash than your 360 degree flasher. Okay, so that was the flashers. The next thing I wanna look at on the table here is you've got a number of offerings. Um, you've got your standard hoochie rig, and I'm just going to point out a couple of things here. We've got a lot to cover. I want to keep moving. Um, this is your standard gold star hoochie. I've got a couple beads in here. I've got a tinsel skirt that's glow. Again, you're going to see glow as a the main theme here. But as I slide this hoochie back and I kind of lay it on the table, you're going to notice pretty much one thing. That bottom hook, that trail hook, is exposed from the skirt. Okay, the point of the hook is right outside of the end of the skirt. The other one is inside of it. The other thing you're gonna notice is that I've got them two different directions. I've got them basically at about a 90 degree angle. So one is pointed up and one is pointed at the side. And I always run my rigs this way because I figure if you know the salmon gets it in its mouth, 
it's going to have a higher likelihood of getting bit, you know, getting one of the two hooks instead of if both hooks are in the same plane, they come up and bite, you know, potentially they can slide off. You know, and another thing with hook design is you always want to run a hook that's offset. Okay. And I know you can buy barbless hooks right out of the bat, but I'm a big proponent of buying a barbed hook and then crimping the barb. There's going to be, you're going to be legal and there's still going to be a little bit of a bump there. I'm always looking for some sort of advantage in this fishery where we're not allowed to use barbed hooks. Okay. Back to the table. The other thing I'm going to talk about here is really the weight of this leader. This is a 40 pound Maxima Ultra Green leader. Um, and this one is running about in that 36 to 40 inch range. And I'll tell you that the, when I talk 36 to 40 inches, I'm measuring from the back of this hook to the very leading edge of this swivel, just so we're talking the same nomenclature. Now, the other thing is, I'm gonna talk about weight, okay? You can't get away with running 30 pound leader on a hoochie and expect it to have the wounded bait action. So with this hoochie and I've got four beads there, I've got a tensile skirt, there's a little bit of weight to this rig. Now, if you run something like an Ace High Fly, this is a totally lighter presentation. Okay, and a slightly different profile too. And especially with all the mylar that goes into these ace high flies, they shine like crazy. And you've got a faceted head as well. This thing's a lot lighter. You're gonna get a lot more whip behind the flasher using the same leader length from an ace high fly than you will from a hoochie. It's good to have both. Um, you know, one of the things when, we, when we're trolling for black mouth, right? We're typically trolling small, uh, slower than we usually would. So we're looking to go just fast enough with the current to get that flasher to flip over. Okay. Now, if you're having trouble or you feel like, Hey, I'm going way too fast, um, to get my flashers to rotate. I will tell you that with these flashers, you can take a heat gun and you can heat up this radius of the flasher and you can actually increase the bend at each end. And that's going to allow you to rotate the 360 degree flasher at a lower speed. So that's a little trick there. Um, back to our offerings at the table. Always love to have glow. Again, kind of mentioned it before, I'm gonna to continue to mention it. Um, both of these are glow, both Ace High Fly and the Hoochie. As we go forward and we look at spoons, I mean, there is just a plethora of offerings and, and I usually carry it all. But one of the things that I will say is that when you're going and you're picking, um, you know, you're picking a spoon, you're picking a Hoochie, you really want to match the hatch, okay? If, if the bait that you're finding in the area, say you catch that one fish, you want to look at what's in that fish's stomach. If that bait is firecracker herring or really small herring, um, match the hatch. Now, now the caveat to that is if you do, say I match the hatch, say we're, we're finding um, candlefish in the fish's stomach and I've got something like um, this ace, ace high fly here that's your needlefish. If I do um, start running that lure or say, hey, say I start running, um, you know, one of these small two inch uh, silver horde um, kingfishers and I realize that, hey, I'm hooking a lot of sublegal fish and that's that seems to be all I'm getting. That's when you need that's when you would abandon the small gear. OK, and start upsizing your gear. Um, you know, a lot of times, even this time of year, you're still going to find the herring that are that are approaching that green label size or still under. So this size of spoon, this three and a half is perfect um, for a blackmouth fishery. Now, you also have um, the coho killer and the coho killer is great as well. Now, one of the things that I will mention is that when they come out of the box, there's really not a lot of bend in that coho killer. So what I do, I'm going to turn this sideways so you can see it on the camera, but I put a pretty mean bend in this coho killer and I'm bending it this radius and this radius to get this really nice, um, not quite a full U, but um, pretty, pretty drastic shape. And that's to drive the action in the spoon. Okay. And you're going to see me do the same thing with a, um, you know, your typical Kingfisher light. I'm going to take the back end of the spoon, especially when I'm trolling slow, even even if you're trolling slow, you still want a lot of action on that lure. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to bend the back end of that lure just like that. Go back to the table. We look at that bend. It almost matches somewhat the angle that I put the back end of the coho killer in. Um, I will mention that what you don't want to do, especially on the coho killer, is when it comes to this wrist section of the tail, you do not want to bend that area of the tail. Okay. 
that, that metal, that's your thinnest cross section of the material and you will experience uh, failure in that region over time, fish after fish. So do not bend it here if you can avoid it. Keep the bends up here. All right. Now, one of the things that we'll talk about too is say you are getting those sublegal fish and they're no matter what you troll you're trolling a four inch spoon maybe even try a five inch spoon and you're still in those small uh, resident chinook salmon you can always go to a plug okay and these plugs fish well year round and this is this one here this is a silver horde plug this is herring aid um, there's just something about the combination of the blue the yellow and the glow that these fish love um, both for the winter snook fishery and also for the summer king fishery so this is something that i'm always going to have on the boat um, is the herring aid plug and these things do fish well and they will get you away you're not going to have as many bites okay typically with plugs as you will um, you know with some of this other gear but you're going to find a lot of the qu more quality fish okay and then one of my favorite offerings and one that's been doing really well up at cq this year is your anchovy rig okay so as we look at the table here and i move some of this other stuff out of the way you're going to see rice davis heads um and depending on what country you're from or what uh, part of what county you're from maybe you say reese maybe you say rice doesn't really matter but it's spelled like this and it looks like this these are the ones that i use and uh, they work really well all right so i got two here just for demonstration purposes um, you're going to notice that i use the wires so you can buy um, the rice davis wires that go in and connect to the head okay now this is like it's almost like cheating this is really like cheating because with that wire i can now take my anchovy and I can put it at the exact bend that I need to get that anchovy to spin in a garden hose, right? That drill bit presentation that I'm looking for. That's that I, basically that's cheating. You're not trying to like, you know, just perfectly, you know, cure the bait and then you're playing with toothpicks and then you're trying to, you know, mess with the hook placement. Nah, once you get this wire in there, it's game over, that's all you have to do. By the way, our presentation bait today, this is brought to you by Man Banjo Minnow. If you grew up in like the 80s or 90s, you remember may remember the infomercial that was sold to you like, hey, you buy the Banjo Minnow, you can catch anything. Well, as a kid, I bothered my parents over and over again, I need the Banjo Minnow. And guess what I found for this demo? The Banjo Minnow. So I'll just kind of show you how this works. Um, now with these heads, the, the nice thing is the wire. And then the other thing is, I can put these hooks wherever I want it. Once I shove this, this anchovy up into this head, I can literally put the hooks, you know, one at the dorsal, let the other one dangle. It doesn't matter. Um, and the hook is not going to change the curvature of the bait. Now here's why. As soon as I get that hook placed, and again, this wire is going to be inside the fish. So as I, as, as we load this, so this is the process for loading this, you're going to take this wire and again, you're going to cut this wire to length. You'll figure out the proper length for the fish. If you pull this, put that bait up to the head, you don't want it sticking out. So I'd probably cut this wire right here. Um, by the way, I also run herring in here. That's why the wire is long. But you're going to take this anchovy and you're going to start this wire. Sorry, Banjo Minnow. Right, right into its gills. And you're going to run it all the way down the length of the anchovy. Okay? And this one needs to be cut, so it's going to stick out the end, but you'll get the idea. Then once you have this wire down here, you're going to put a bend in that anchovy. Okay, you're going to bend the head a little bit, you're going to bend the tail a little bit, and you're going to get that nice curve that you're looking for, again, to provide that drill bit presentation. Okay, and then once you have that drill bit presentation you like, just remember that position of the wire. Okay, and then as soon as you get it in there, you're going to take the, the lead hook and you're going to put that right along the dorsal fin through here. And, you know, and sometimes I run it all the way through if it's skinny and oops, right here, I'll run it straight through. If it's skinny, if it's a little bit thicker, um, you can run it along the side either way, depending on the bait. And then you can cinch this up to where you want it. You can put the toothpick in it and that's going to hold your leader just like that. It's not going to, because you put a toothpick in it, it is not going to pull on this leader and change the curvature of that anchovy.
Okay. And then, you know, the other thing is the reason we use these is they are just, it's just a great way um, to make a hearty bait. If you do brine your bait, you can run that bait for an hour and a half and it'll be just fine in that anchovy head. As long as you can preserve the head of the bait into that helmet, it's going to run for a while. Now, I mean, hopefully it only lasts 15 minutes and you get bit, but um, that's why we brine the bait and that's why we use the heads. And especially, you know, I grew up um, trolling the ocean on sport fishers without trolling valves and with one engine in gear, the slowest we could go was like two, two and a half to 2.7 knots. And we had to use heads, right? And so just grew up using heads. Great way to preserve your bait. Um, and, you know, I tell you what, this year at CQ, they just been knocking them dead with the anchovies. And they've been running them right on the bottom, in the dirt, in the mud, and getting bit over and over again. So that is the anchovy rig. Um, now, you, the other thing I'm going to mention here, you're going to notice two different um, downrigger releases here on the table. You're going to notice the pro release and you're going to notice your typical Scotty release. When I am running bait, I like to use the Scotty release because it gives a little less tension on the bait than the pro release. The pro release I use a lot for gear. When I know that I want a deep hook set on that fish or a good hook set before it releases off of this release, I'll use this pro release. Now I will tell you that when you run this, there's a little bit of a learning curve on it. And if you wrap the line the wrong way around the bobbin, you are going to break your main line. So be careful, read the directions, make sure you know how to use it. But I use this one for gear and I use the Scotty release. Uh, for bait, okay, because I feel that they can, the, the fish can take the bait easier, it can turn with the bait in its mouth, not feel as much tension, feels natural, and they can turn and make sure that they get the hook seated in the corner of their mouth. So that's the reason for this, this release here. Okay, all right, and those are the tips and tricks for fishing black mouth, and really anywhere black mouth. It doesn't matter if you're fishing CQ, Puget Sound, um, San Juan Islands, um, really applies anywhere where you're fishing for those resident um, Chinook juvenile salmon. Works really well, cover the, cover the gamut. All right, don't go anywhere. We're gonna be right back with Matt Messing. We're gonna see how he's been doing up in CQ. Stay tuned. Defiance boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why we back our boats with a lifetime warranty. All of our Defines boats come standard with large fish boxes that are fully insulated so that you can ice your fish properly all day. Defines boats feature a 21 to 22 degree dead rise at the transom and a large reverse chine for incredible handling and stability offshore. Defines boats are foam flotation filled and unsinkable for the ultimate in safety while fishing offshore. Defines boats feature fuel efficient hull designs with large fuel tank capacity so that you can have maximum fuel range for making long offshore runs completely safe and affordable. All Defines boats come standard with self bailing decks for improved safety while at sea. Defines boat offers all our boats with Honda outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five year top to prop warranty from your Honda Outboard. Defines boats for all your boating needs and let us help you get out on the water. Today, the need for quality private security services is at an all time high. Contract Security Service provides day to day peace of mind as they protect people and property. Phoenix Protective Corporation strives for excellence. Above all, Phoenix security officers are managed by leaders trained to inspire and encourage greatness. Here at Phoenix, we provide service for multiple state and federal contracts with service ranging from uniform, patrol, alarm monitoring, canine detection, executive protection, as well as investigative work. We here at Phoenix are looking for highly motivated individuals to apply. If you're a vet, retired or active, and would like to work with us, please apply. All right, welcome back in studio. Tommy, nicely done, man. Thank that, you. A ton of information, all provided free 
Yes. Just throwing it out there, folks, just yep, so you can trying. take advantage of that and uh, get on it. You know, if you have ideas or things or techniques mm -hmm. or issues you're having out there on the water in the woods, uh, hit us up. Message us up on our Facebook page. Uh, send us comments on our YouTube channel. We try to answer all those comments and questions that come mm -hmm. in quite frequently, to be honest. And uh, if you have something you want to see Tommy or I do in the bait lab uh, relative to a fishery you're out there doing, because we're... We really put effort in to try and cover all these fisheries, man. Not yeah. just talk about them. We, we actually mm -hmm. drag our boat and go do them so that we experience and gain knowledge as well. So, yeah. Well, um, you jokingly, you know, I got done with the Bay Lab and I asked you how long, because we're always trying to manage the clock, right? right, right. And I jokingly asked you how long was it? Yeah. And you said 25. I'm like, what? I think it was a little long. But, <laughs> no. you know, there's so much. When I look at all that that gear on the table for yeah. salmon fishing, you know, and black mouth, whether it's black mouth or summer king fishing, yep. I mean, I could have spent... 12 minutes just talking about that bait rig and getting into detail about mm -hmm. that. So that's one of the things that we'll have to do is spin off that bait lab that I just yeah. did into separate mm -hmm. separate topics to go deeper. Yeah, because uh, some of them deserve a full full on uh, yeah. coverage on its own, right? So uh, we can certainly do that. So uh, lots of folks happy with the information you provided, my friend. So uh, right with on. that, speaking of black mouth, Speaking of CQ and speaking of messing around with gear, uh, <laughs> none other than himself, Matt Messing, messing around charters. How you doing, buddy? Thanks for uh, thanks for hanging on. Doing good, doing good. Yeah, I think I even learned a little something there from Tommy. Oh, oh right wait, on, brother, stop right the train. On. Hold on. What? <laughs> uh, well, it doesn't look like you need to learn a whole lot because based on your pictures and your last outing over there to CQ, uh, you flat out whacked and stacked. Let's first talk a little bit about the black mouth opportunity and how well it's fishing and uh you know kind of kind of what you did to find fish how were you successful yeah uh well first off i uh, couldn't ask for a better day yeah. nice flat water it was, it was absolutely gorgeous out there but uh yeah we uh we, we picked a spot and we uh we ran out there and just kind of you know kind of pick a depth you know i was hearing some reports and some stuff you know some guys around one you know, 195 ish or something like that so i kind of started at like 180s and uh, just you know, pick a direction, start trolling, you know, just try to figure out the tides. But, man, there was such a strong current out there just, just pumping out the whole time. It was a uh, run-up, troll, run-up, troll mm -hmm. kind of a game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a couple passes kind of worked, you know, shallow, deep, shallow, deep, found that bait and just started working. There you go. Yeah. And so what, just, just, just to clarify for kind of the listeners and the viewers, um, you know, a lot of times in our ocean fishery and especially fishing around CQ or out on Swiftshire Bank, um, the current is moving so quickly and you always want to go with the current. You got to outrun it to make sure your gear's working and spinning. Yeah. But the current's going so fast that you can't troll with it and turn around and expect to go anywhere the other direction. So you actually have to pull up the gear, pick it up, put it in the boat and then cruise back up to the top of the troll. Mm hmm. Yep. And make sure you kind of go out away from the other boats when you when you yeah, cruise back. Oh, you know, yeah, that's a good point. You know, a lot of guys want to go zigzag in between everybody, and you know, mm -hmm. that's just yeah. I don't know, it's not safe and it's a little aggravating. Yeah, I know a couple guys that do that on a regular yeah. basis. I was going to say, do you want to name any individuals? <laughs> <laughs> Some boats are more recognizable than others, uh, and don't be that guy. So yeah. valid valid point. So you kind of started on that one eighty line. Did you find fish in a little closer in a little shallower water? Um, no, not really. Mm -hmm. I, I spent most of my time at 200. That's oh, wow. where, I mean, literally I, I would move out like 10, 15 feet and boom, there's bait. Mm -hmm. I, I would come in 10, 10 to 25 feet or so. Did not much blank screen. So I just, you know, it was a, uh, it was really a 200 line thing yeah. going on big time. Uh, what'd you get them going after? Spoons, hoochies, bait, rolling bait out there. I mean, good time yeah. to do yeah, it. Yeah. We, uh, we, we had some chovies with us. We, uh, we were rolling some chovies. Uh, they seemed to work for the first, you know, hour or two in the morning. And then, uh, then they just stopped. It was just nothing. Mm. Uh, most everything else was coming off of the three and a half inch, uh, Kingfisher spoons. Yeah. Very nice. What, what yeah. colors were working best? The good old herring aid. Good old herring, herring aid. A little old herring aid, hot spot slash with a herring aid spoon, you know? Oh, yeah. Right on. Any scent? No, I don't use that. Nothing. Don't put nothing, nothing on it. Yeah. No, no, just my just my dirty fingers. <laughs> <laughs> just the There's messing scent. There's enough stuff on that boat, man. Yeah. I touch enough fishy stuff on that boat, you know. Yeah, man, messing scent. Like it. Get a bottle of that stuff yeah. up. Huh? Yeah. How, uh, they love it. <laughs> how, how is it looking up there? You know where we are on on the quota, and how many boats did you see out there fishing? 
Uh, there was a good handful. I mean, it was by no means packed. See, you know, that weekend for how nice it was, uh, not not many guys, you know, mm-hmm. really there. The parking lots weren't jam packed. There's still a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of dots and stuff out up in there, so there's not a lot of places to park. And I just I didn't see it overly overly done. You know, I think there's probably maybe ten or fifteen guys. You know, in one area. Good. Out of time. Okay. Yeah, that's not yeah. bad. I mean, that's kind yeah. of surprising. I mean, you were there only the show in town. And yeah, uh, with the only show in town, and it's fishing so good for mm-hmm. several. Yeah. A few guys will always struggle, but for some guys that get her dialed in pretty quick, uh, the fishing's good. So you uh, you got your salmon, then you bounced out and went after some uh, some bottom fish and some ling cod. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, gosh, that was uh, that was on fire too. You know, just kind of kind of like with the ocean guys and Ian was talking about earlier. It was just hungry, hungry, hungry fish. Yeah. It was great. Mm-hmm. I think we got our our, our sea bass in a uh, matter of like ten minutes with four guys. It was. <laughs> Drop down, get bit, reel up. Like that right. was it. It was non nonstop. We had to. The only time we stopped was to hurry up and count some fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah. good. Yeah, that's a good morning. Let's talk a little bit about technique and presentation, depth of water you're looking at. You fishing structure? You fishing kelp? What are you? Where are you finding these fish? Rockfish. I found a really good school that wanted to play off the kelp beds, okay. kind of down there a little ways. You know, um, just held on. It was you know a little tough because it was fast, fast drifts. So. And you're kind of you're having to motor into it, so it was extra fast. But just find the fish, get the boat all get everything lined up, get lines in. We uh we were just using the little Point Wilson darts, you know, like the little laser minnows and stuff like that. And just I mean, it, as soon as you got down in them, it was just get, you're, you're getting bit. You lose one, you get bit again. Lose mm-hmm. one, you get bit again. Mm-hmm. I mean, you just there was no way to find any kind of poor fisherman at that spot. It was great. Well, you definitely, uh, yeah, you had a great couple of days. So we're gonna we're gonna load up and jump on the boat. We'll be out there midweek. Uh, weather looks conducive thus far. We'll have to take another look at that window. But um, I'm uh, really anticipating getting into some blackmouth, getting out there on some uh, rockfish and a few uh, mm-hmm. link cod. See if we can't put that all together. Get some uh, good video content for the viewers next week and uh, see what we can do. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, bring bring some of those breakaway flashers with you. I, I still my stubborn butt so okay. I haven't used any of them. Okay. I'd love to check Th- them. Those are mine, Matt. Uh. He doesn't he, he doesn't have any. Oh, he's gonna you got to make your own. Oh, I, I got to make. He's got to make. Oh, oh, I got to make my own. Okay. You know what's funny is I had like thirty different flashers and I had converted every one. <laughs> I don't. I do not run a single one. It's not a breakaway. That's you know when you're sitting around nothing to do but talk about fishing and uh, you don't go fishing. You might as well make break. I, I wouldn't know what that's like. Yeah, I know. So. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I did convert a number of them. Yes, I will bring them. And I do have a, a number of the hearing aid ones ready to go as well. We used them last year and they work fantastic. So uh, I think you should try a coconut rod. I think What's you that? should work a coconut rod into the setup. I, yeah. 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 I mean, you could. I mean, yeah. right? I mean, most of these fish are, I don't know, five. Yeah, you could. You five, probably seven, maybe eight pounds. Yeah, I could probably yeah, recover. We got about 300 yeah. feet of downrigger cable. That'd be, I that'd got be great. Yeah. Line on them. Uh, yeah, from when we were fishing them for resident coho last year, they're all rigged, ready to go. Now, now I, I, I'm going to say one more thing. I did get word on the street yeah. that there was some bait in shallower water, okay, mm-hmm. in less than yeah. 100 feet of water. Mm. And as my mind, I don't know, it's like I've been half converted because my mind automatically popped to jingling jigs what if we threw jigs at those fish mm-hmm. and twitched black mouth up huh we could what? oh that'd be fine that would be you can that would be awesome yeah there, yeah. there were definitely some some birds working some schools really close into shore but you know i we, i caught that one fish out there and i wasn't about to change up my program well yeah, no, i understand that there's nothing <laughs> yeah. there's nothing to keep us from uh, actually throwing out a you know a full-on ounce yeah tie up some big one or two ounce right uh, big jigs, big twitching jigs, drop them down for them, shouldn't know. Yeah. Or you just use a big ohuchi on it. If on you if you know where the bait is and there's mm-hmm. fish concentrated on that mm-hmm. ball, you can make drifts through it and get those jigs in front of their face. That'd be pretty fun. Yeah. That'd make a yeah. great video. Huh? Yeah, that'd be fantastic. So uh something to think about get tying over their beard we got things to do so uh all right matt fantastic you um man looking forward to that may 1st opener as well when you get uh, back in the puget sound waters i i am i am i'm ready to do some lean fishing here yes sir get mm. back, uh, 
when you, when you get uh, back into town. <laughs> need, yeah, when you get back into town, yeah. you need to start. Uh, you need to start cult- cultivating your uh, live bait. bait ten. Yes. <laughs> get that bait. Uh, mama bear. Get getting, his, getting his little bait den going. That's right. So. Uh, yeah, I've been a little sketched. I haven't really seen a lot of pogies down around the docks lately. I'm, right. getting, I'm a little nervous. Oh, they're hiding from you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they know now. Out. They know what's up. Collect them pogies. Yeah, they get the words out. Get that goldfish food going. Yeah. Yeah, they love that goldfish food. Don't be messing. Did they around. really? Yeah, you can get. That's uh, right. You can get them kind of whipped up with that. Right. Oh, the oh man, you get them boiling. They'll start, pop, mm-hmm. they'll start popping on the water like crazy. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I used to get them as a kid. I used to walk down the dock and I would kick the barnacles off of the right. piling, right. and those perch would just, just gather in hordes and mm-hmm. eat eat the little pieces of barnacle. Well, we got time. Uh, we got a few a uh, few days until May first, so yeah, we got to start collecting some live bait. So mm-hmm. we'll uh, we'll get to work on that program. So all right, buddy, always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us on the show once again, and uh, looking forward to this next week. Going to be out there at CQ for a couple of days and going to have a blast. So well done. Can't wait. All Can't right, wait. Thanks, Matt. Okay. See you guys later. Yep. Talk to you soon. See ya. All right, Matt. Messing mess around charges. You know. Doesn't matter where he's fishing, he always seems to get in the fish. Whether yeah. he goes out there and runs boats for Coleman on Westport or he's back in Puget Sound running his own mm-hmm. boat, uh, he's definitely looking forward to that link cut opener. Maybe we'll be fishing with Matt, maybe, maybe we'll be in my boat, but, but we're definitely, definitely doing the live bait deal for link cut again. Definitely making some updated 2021 videos in that regard. Show you exactly how to do it like we did last year. So much fun and people need to get on mm-hmm. that program, right, Tommy? I agree. Okay. Live bait is my life. Live bait is his life. And with that life, we're going to uh, check on out of here. We're, uh, we're a little late this evening, but a lot of folks stuck around, so we appreciate that. Hopefully, you enjoyed the content. We try to bring it to you live here each and every Thursday, 6 p.m., as we do on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Go to our YouTube channel. If you have not, please subscribe. Let's build those numbers. Continue to build that channel. And uh, we'll continue to bring you the content each and every week. And you are back for quite a while, so we got a I lot am. of things to tackle, buddy. So, all right, that's going to do it for us here. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, if you got questions, comments, concerns, hit us up on Facebook. Message us up is usually the best way. Go to our um, webpage. Check out our webpage. Leave comments and uh, information there. You can email us from that vantage point also. And check out all our online wares. we got so much logo items and hats and things that need to be out there on the people wearing them Mm. as you're fishing and hunting, doing your thing. So have a great uh, week. We'll see you next Thursday right here, 6 p.m. Fish on Northwest and uh, enjoy.